into the video and then after that David and Tim will um, provide further detail by way of introduction of our special guests tonight. So thank you. Ah, the bullet train from New York to DC. It always brings me back to when I first started making this commute. In 2019, I was a freshman in the most diverse Congress in history. Up to that point, it was a critical time. I'll never forget the children in our community. They were so inspired to see this new class of politicians who reflected them navigating the halls of power. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet and that we had all the technology to do it. But people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. 10 years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create doubt and denial about climate change. It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing. And it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking like there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. It took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 years left to cut our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything, how we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. The only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people and most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remembered that as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression, World War II. We knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The wave began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and then the Senate and the White House in 2020, and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the federal jobs guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, 
The biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate, restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves with the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit Southern Florida, parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stopped being so scared of the future. We stopped being scared of each other, and we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too, and in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, riding that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us. And the first big step was just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see. Good evening, everyone. Oops. No, it was on. That's on. Okay. It still works. Sorry about that. I thought I didn't have a microphone for a sec. To begin with, before we introduce our speakers for tonight, I just want to get you to reflect for a couple of minutes on what we just watched and, in my case, listened to. How do you feel about what you just sat through? Just sit and reflect on it for a minute while I talk. It can be really inspiring to have a vision put in front of you of what is possible, or it can actually feel really confronting. If you're used to the idea of living in a world that feels pretty much okay and is comprehensible as it is, so you want to stay with it as it is. This video has been watched by so many million people worldwide because it taps into hope and it, to some people, looks like a bit much, but the message that AOC actually tries to get across more than any other single thing is courage. The courage to have a vision and find a way to implement it. If we look at the details of what they endeavour to achieve, it's all technically possible, but it takes the courage to begin. What they're essentially describing is an anti-fragile system. A system by the time it's finished gets better when it's stressed, gets better when it goes through hardship, because every part of the system is designed to keep improving. You can't show that in seven minutes, but that's the point of the kind of science underpin underpinning it. So what we have here is a vision that could lead, if we had enough courage, to an anti-fragile system. If we contrast that with this week in Australia, the federal government have just announced the Climate Resilience and Adaptation Strategy, the CRAS. <laughs> it has also been called the CARP and the CRAP. <laughs> Once again, let's look at the power of words here. 
Resilience means something is robust enough to take a hit. It doesn't get any better. Adaptation simply means that something has a different structure or a different function. Once again, to adapt does not mean to be any better. So what the crass has laid out in the last four days is something that is robust enough to survive, adaptable enough to be different, but there's no mention of anything better. There's no courage and there's no vision. When you're thinking about what questions to ask our panellists tonight, please have a think about what kind of world you want to live in and what kind of world you want to leave behind. Have you got enough courage to ask for more and to contribute to more? Or is resilience and adaptation in their narrowest defined form <coughs> all you can imagine? Now, to give you a bit of help to show you what is possible, let's think of the last very strange year of our lives. COVID-19 has been a remarkable moment where we've seen that if the threat is big enough, we become capable. There is nothing surprising in this. Jonathan Haidt, brilliant American psychologist, has been talking about this for over a decade. What he argues in a book called The Righteous Mind is that until you have an immediate common threat, nothing will happen, which is exactly what's happened for the last 30 years. But once you have an immediate common threat, action begins. And action with COVID has been very interesting. Not only... <coughs> have governments saved lives, they've also saved livelihoods. They've seen that major issues are interconnected. So the major issues we face today of climate change, systemic unemployment and rising inequality could be seen as separate things if we wanted to just talk about them. But the best solutions to address them are probably going to see them as part of the same world we live in and the same world that we want to turn into a more anti-fragile place. So please, think about all of that as you're coming up with your questions. How it's going to work tonight is there's microphones that are going to run around the audience. Tim's got a set of questions in front of him. Um, I'm going to rely on Tim to see where the microphone's going and to decide who goes next in having a question, because that's a lot better than me just taking guesses. And if I want more clarity out of you as the questioners, I'll ask. If you editorialise, I will ask you to stop and be clear. And I will very politely ask the same of our three panellists. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll pass over to Tim to get introductions done. Yes, well, thank you all for, for coming up this evening. Uh, it's fantastic to see such a great turnout, and thank you, of course, to SPAG. <laughs> for having us. It's fantastic to be here. And we, of course, wouldn't be able to do this without our esteemed guests. So, of course, thank you for joining us, uh, Susan Close, uh, Senator Rex Patrick, and Barbara Pocock. Uh, it's fantastic to have an opportunity to, um, for all of us, really, to have kind of a deliberative uh, discussion in our democracy. So, um, as David said, uh, please, at any point, uh, feel free to put a hand up if there's something urgent, uh, an urgent question. Um, but we will start with opening statements, and I would like to start with uh, Susan Close, if you, if you could open for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina Mani. It's um, wonderful to see you all here. I hadn't quite believed that they were going to fill the theatre uh, uh, in the middle of the week. Uh, it's just uh, so heartening to have so many people who care. Um, I apologise that I'm a last minute ring in, I'll do my best, I'm not in the federal sphere so we might be talking slightly across purposes or at different levels but uh, I'll, I will do my best. Uh, I uh, love seeing uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez any time and uh, I always get a bit teary, um, with, there's something about her sense of hope that really gets to me. Um, and uh, that's so important I think for all of us to be able to visualise uh, what could be in the future. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about, I'm uh, sort of overwhelmed and delighted that much of what AOC lay lays out is where my thoughts had turned uh, with the relatively short notice of thinking about what I would say tonight. 
Um, I wanted to start with the natural world, as she talked about um, the importance of uh, restoring the wetlands, of working uh, to uh, restore and rescue nature. Um, if we had no problem with carbon, if carbon weren't a noxious gas that contributes to uh, greenhouse, uh, the greenhouse effect, uh, we would have a terrible crisis on our hands nonetheless with the loss of biodiversity. Uh, the fact is we have two crises that we're facing. Uh, they interact. Uh, the, there is a desperate need for us to have a strong growing uh, plant life to help absorb carbon and the warming, uh, the warming climate is putting further pressure on biodiversity. But the truth is we would be having a biodiversity and extinction crisis regardless. And so I think any uh, contemplation of the future and a clean recovery, which I think is the theme for tonight, uh, must start with how we bend our resources to protecting and restoring the natural world. Uh, I, am, I understand the Samuels Review has come out today. Uh, I think that it doesn't suggest that the states should be left entirely in control of development decisions. If that's the case, I agree. <laughs> states should not be able to make decisions about development when uh, fragile environments are concerned. And I would like to see much of the financial resources that we put to recovery being to the kind of green jobs, uh, or jobs for nature as they're calling it in New Zealand, uh, where they're putting over a billion dollars into uh, working on the natural environment as part of their COVID response. Uh, I would like to see that kind of emphasis. Um, the second area that, that I was contemplating which I think was only partially addressed in AOC, which is seven minutes isn't long, uh, is this question of consumption. And that is both uh, a, a problem with the challenge of the demands we've placed on this earth, that we, we are literally capitalists in the sense that we're eating the capital, the natural capital of the earth. Uh, and also, of course, uh, much of our consumption is uh, very much contributing to the uh, emissions. And so how we redraw our, our um, consumption of resources is going to be an important discussion. And we seem to have it in fits and starts in this country. Uh, the current discussion, I think, it could be quite productive, which is about the circular economy and increasing uh, recycling, but uh, still more important, avoidance in the first place and reusing and then making sure that, that materials are treated as resources, not as waste. Uh, I, I think we're in very uh, infant stages of that, uh, but I see some hope that that is something that is being discussed and it's being discussed in the context of COVID recovery. Uh, one minute, oh gosh. Uh, emissions was my third bit. Um, uh, and of course, we in South Australia uh, kind of exemplify the challenge where we have very, very low carbon electricity production, which is fabulous and really very much to the credit of the South Australian public that has embraced it so strongly. Uh, but also we dig up a lot of fossil fuels, not as much as some of the other states, but we do. We rely on fossil fuels to be dug up and we are going to have a very big economic transition to manage. And there was a good discussion of the uh, ad ad adapting work taking people out of carbon intensive work and moving into other work, including care, the caring economy, but also uh, I think um, there, there's a lot of scope for more um, complex and high value work as well. Uh, so they're, they're the three elements of the clean recovery that I would like to see. Uh, and I, I watch with interest to see what our federal government does and I am participating actively in trying to push our state government and uh, of course both sides of politics in that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan Close. Uh, next, we did pick this at random, but it is quite convenient. We will be hearing opening statement from Senator Rex Patrick. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, thank you for inviting me along. Uh, I'm an independent senator for South Australia. You can tell I'm independent because uh, as I sat down here, I had to write some notes about what I was going to say. Um, my, my day started off talking, uh, doing a podcast on Chinese influence in, in, the, the, uh, in the Pacific region. I then went to industrial relations uh, matters. I then uh, talked to some people about uh, uh, freedom in Hong Kong. I uh, then went to a COVID committee 
uh, talking about vaccines for most of the afternoon and then Susan Lay contacted me in respect of the EPBC Act. So uh, um, that's the sort of nature of, of the, the, the task when you are uh, an independent and uh, often a lot of responsibility falls on your, on your shoulders uh, having casting votes uh, in a lot of things that take place in the Senate. Um, just uh, you know, in relation to climate change, there are a, r a range of different views, and uh, I think at this uh, panel tonight, there won't be a lot of difference. Um, although we could have had Joel Fitzgibbon here, that would have made it uh, perhaps a little bit interesting. Um, uh, the perhaps uh, maybe some differences in the approach that's taken in addressing uh, climate change. Uh, I'm a big believer in the fact that we have to address climate change in a manner that is uh, sensible. Uh, look for some low-hanging fruit. Electric vehicles, for, a, for as, as one particular um, example, uh, uh, we, we see uh, the, the coalition government shying away from doing anything there, even though all the car manufacturers have made their decisions about it. And uh, you know that electric vehicles are a technology that do deal with carbon emissions. It deals with pollution. It's actually more productive because of the efficiencies of electric vehicles. It solves fuel security problems, a range of really good things, and yet not much happening on that front. Uh, there's uh, there, there's a, a lot of, a lot that can be done. Uh, thankfully, in uh, my IFO this year, I managed to get five million dollars for a, uh, a vehicle startup, electric vehicle startup here in South Australia. So. Um, and I'm you know, doing some work in the background to, to try and promote electric vehicles through things like the Formula E um, race that uh, has been proposed for, uh, <laughs> proposed for Adelaide. Um, the uh, other, other areas, of course, are energy. Um, that, that's a, another big uh, area, energy generation. Uh, I know a lot of people say, let's go renewable, let's go really hard. Uh, we saw what happened in this state when we didn't do it properly. We went, we went really hard, so that's good, but we didn't engineer it properly and we saw ourselves, uh, the entire state, black out. Um, uh, on, so, uh, and, and of course you might, you might uh, argue the toss over the, reason, uh, over the reasoning behind that, but uh, I've, I've, just, I've just seen the, um, you know, the, the, the fines that have gone to one of the wind generation companies because they couldn't meet the N minus one criteria in respect of uh, uh, reliability. And you know, we, as we approach uh, this, you know, here's an answer to a question on notice I ask quite regularly. Uh, that shows the amount of times AEMO intervened in the South Australia market. I know that we had a great day where we had 100% energy, uh, uh, renewable energy at one, at, uh, for, for one day. Um, and that's really, really good. Uh, but on most days, AEMO intervened in our market three times a day. So. We've got to find a realistic solution that doesn't leave elderly people um, uh, sweltering on a hot day uh, because there is no uh, because there's load shedding occurring and so forth. So we just have to be mindful of the way in which we get there. Even if you are a, a climate change denialist, uh, um, um, denialist uh, and uh, I know a few of them, um, the interesting thing is that everyone agrees that the, 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 that global warming is happening. It really comes down to just the cause. Some people don't accept that we are the cause of it. Uh, so another interesting aspect of this is even if we put that to one side and we recognise it's occurring, that means we have to come up with sensible solutions for things like the Murray-Darling and making sure there is not over-extraction. Yet that, do that doesn't seem to even be happening in an environment where at least everyone agrees the globe is warming. Uh, another example of that is uh, fire, re fire resilience where we know things are changing and uh, yet we're still not doing anything uh, about that. That's things we could do without, uh, without argument because everyone agrees the globe is warming. So uh, lots, of, uh, lots of things that, uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, we can do to, to, to try and arrest what is happening. Uh, we need to do that in a sensible way. Uh, but there are things we need to be doing right now that recognises what everyone agrees with, and that is the fact that the globe is warming. Thank you. Thank you, Rex. And we'll move on to Barbara. Right. Thank you. Can you hear all right, right at the back? Is that you can hear us? Good. Um, thank you so much all for coming out. It's a real pleasure to be here, and, and thanks for the opportunity 
to talk to you. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, that we're on Ghana land and add my uh, respects to Elders past and present. I think we all know it's been a big week for First Nations people, so um, uh, I think it's important to remember that this was land that uh, a frontier war was fought on and we need to change the date and many other things. Um, it's 40 years since uh, I finished studying uh, economics here in this university and for the last 30 years of that time um, and right up to the start of the pandemic, Australia enjoyed unprecedented levels of economic growth. And f so for me, politics really is about choice. Um, what choices do we make? So what did we choose to do with that last great economic windfall? Did we make childcare free? Did we decide to fix Aboriginal deaths in custody? Did we make sure that the generation coming after me have access to free education and affordable housing? Did we listen to the climate science that was coming down at us and make the kind of adaptions in advance of it that we could have done? We didn't do any of those things. And the truth is, we could have afforded to do all of those things. So for me, uh, thinking about the clean recovery as you've asked us to do, um, it's all about choice. Um, we could have done so many other things, but instead something really significant happened, and that is inequality was turbocharged, um, and a full-blown climate crisis is now before us. Our nation looked after the wealthy very well in that last 30 years, so that now 1% of Australians own as much as 70%. And of course, it's much worse in the US. We blew those years, and we blew those billions. And sadly, the Morrison government has increased inequality even further. Just read the Financial Review, it's not a radical thought. Uh, mainstream economists are showing us the data on this. Um, we, we widened inequality in our response to the pandemic and we've taken action in the wrong direction on climate change. The gov government met the pandemic with a huge spend, 200 billion. That's the right amount to reach for, but it's been spent on many cases on the wrong things. And I believe we should be making a range of other choices. We should be making a choice to invest rapidly in renewable energy, in solar, wind and green hydrogen, and many countries are doing this. We should be investing in renewables infrastructure, the kind we need to cope with the climate crisis, and we must not subsidise coal and gas. We should be making a choice to build clean, affordable public transport, not more roads. And we should be making a choice to fund job-intensive nature regeneration that creates jobs for our young people, that restores after bushfires and greens our country and our river system. We should be making a choice to be emissions neutral by 2035, a choice that is a very long way from Scott Morrison's love affair with fossil fuel. And very sadly, a long way from Joel Fitzgibbon, who last night was triumphant at Mark Butler's loss of Labor's climate portfolio. Like many of you, I'm sure, I feel real sadness and anger at this loss, which is widely seen as a sign that the ALP is throwing in the towel on serious climate action. We should be making a choice for a decent care system. Free childcare would cost just five of that 200 billion. It'd be good for women, be good for our uh, workforce, for workers, really important for our kids, especially kids in poor households. We should be making a choice for an education system that, where education is free and not where thousands of staff lose their, lose their jobs as fees are doubled for the humanities. For me, politics is about choice, but it's also about integrity. Over the past 20 years, we heard this week the major parties have each taken $25 million from the fossil fuel sector, either directly or indirectly. State capture is cheap in Australia, and that's what we're dealing with. We need to decide whether, as we come out of this pan pandemic, we want to hand over more power to people like Gina Reinhart and Joel Fitzgibbon, or take action on climate change, on inequality and on job creation. So sadly, the Morrison government has really missed the boat. We've got so many things we need to do around inequality and job creation and on justice. 
But I want to say that it's not too late to turn things around and to make the right choices. We know what the solutions are. We've got the tools we need them, and heaven knows we've got the money. What we need to do is build a better society, the one that backs our kids and doesn't back the vested interests, and we need to make some really different choices. And the coming federal election is an opportunity for all of us in this room to do some of that. Thank you. I do want to remind our guests uh, the tendency can be to talk about climate because it is often seemingly our largest existential threat. And I would like to see a little bit more of uh, the inclusion of jobs in, in, in some of those statements that you've made. But I, I will open then with a question uh, about unemployment, uh, specifically for Barbara. What are your views of the assumption by many economists and politicians that 4 to 5 per cent unemployment rate is necessary to a healthy economy? Well, I disagree. Oh. <laughs> it's ironic that you would say that I should pay more attention to employment since that's what my last 40 years has actually been about. Um, <laughs> And I, I think that's a really interesting question. Economists in the 1960s told us that we needed a natural rate of unemployment, 4%, 5% to discipline the economy, keep people at work uh, and, and fend off inflation. I think that's absolutely the wrong thing to look at these days. Uh, we're looking at 6 and 7% official unemployment at the moment. That is, if you work an hour, you're counted in those numbers. More than double the number of Australians uh, beyond that are in underemployment. A huge number of Australians, especially young people, are employed but aren't paid the legal rate. We've got wage theft that's an epidemic proportion in our country. So I think the big problems for us now are certainly unemployment, they're underemployment, they're illegal payments and of course we've got a massive epidemic of job insecurity as well. So I think there's a lot of complex issues in our labour market that we should be responding to. I'm totally with you that jobs matter. Sorry, I didn't mean to assume that you didn't, didn't think that. that was <laughs> I, I, I will direct then a question toward uh, other two panellists. What would you regard as full employment? We'll start with Rex. <laughs> yeah, sure. I, um, it, it's interesting that economists uh, uh, do, do modelling in relation to these sorts of things. Uh, my, one, of my, one of the things I always try and do is uh, not, not, not uh, target the perfect because you often end up being disappointed. You try and make things better than what they are now. So we have an unemployment problem, we have a casualisation problem, I agree uh, entirely with um, uh, yeah, the proposition that's been put forward that, that uh, yeah, unemployment rates don't really reflect the truth. But uh, you know, what, we, what we need to do is concentrate uh, not on what the number should be, I mean yes we can have goals, we just need to make sure that as we uh, govern we, we make sure people are able to get jobs and, and the, the uh, yeah, climate change gives an opportunity. There are lots of things we can do uh, to address climate change and also have jobs. I might just say, uh, having talked about industrial relations with, with some businesses today, uh, uh, where, where, there, where there are changes proposed to industrial relations laws uh, you know, to deal with things like casualisation uh, and, and so forth, um, and uh, uh, no better off tests and so forth, uh, when, I'm, when, when I have businesses come and talk to me about um, how this might uh, upset or, or um, curtail employment, uh, I remind them that over the last uh, few years we've seen record profits. We haven't seen workers sharing in those profits, and that's a huge problem. Uh, and I'm also just recently looking at things like JobKeeper where, where the taxpayer supported uh, some of these large businesses and uh, uh, turns out they also made record profit. There are some companies, Toyota being one of them, that have just paid JobKeeper back, $18 million. Uh, there's, there's a number of companies that are, are now looking at that. And uh, I'll, I'll probably put it out publicly at some stage, uh, well, perhaps I'm doing that now, but, but uh, tying uh, industrial relation form to social integrity from the businesses that may benefit from that. You can't come and say to people, uh, that uh, you know, business are here to save uh, all the workers when they're not operating with social licence. Uh, my, my ability to believe them uh, degrades. Thank you. Uh, I, I think 
The, one of the problems with this idea that four or five percent means of unemployment means full, full employment is that it's um, so woefully inaccurate. Uh, as Barbara pointed out, uh, you don't need to be working very much to be triggered at being listed as employed. So far more interesting is the question of being underemployed or unemployed. And uh, I don't buy that the economy works better when there is X percent of people who are desperate. Um, that's not the kind of economy we should choose to have, and economies are a, a choice. Um, I, I think it's also a, a matter, though, that we need to get into this question of what work is. Uh, again, if we didn't have the climate crisis and we didn't have the extinction crisis, we would still nonetheless be having another challenge, which is the effect of the fourth industrial revolution of digitisation, automation, AI. That is fundamentally changing the nature of work. And it's doing so in a way that is being masked by lots of other issues but is going to increasingly redraw what it means to have a human interacting versus a machine interacting. And if we are still in the uh, original industrial age way of thinking about what employment is and what being a meaningful human being is, which is going out of your house, labouring and coming back with money, uh, then we are not going to manage this next stage of our, of our economic revolution. Um, so although uh, I'm not signed up to the universal um, income idea, because I, I have a lot of questions about it, I understand why it's being talked about and I, I respect what it's trying to do. And I think we, if we're having more debates about that and more debates about what it means simply to have enough to live a meaningful life as a share, an equity share of being part of this society, rather than always about a, a, a transactional exchange. I think it, w we are at the kind of inflection point where as, as much as um, I'm sort of an, an Obama-style incrementalist at times, I think we also have to acknowledge that we are not in the times that allow just for incrementalism. And that if we're not at least having this debate amongst people who, who are wanting to participate in it uh, and uh, are greater thinkers than I am about, about what the future is, then we're going to miss this opportunity and we're just going to sort of flounder around. So uh, I, I think your question is very interesting, but it starts here and it probably needs to be you know, as big as this room and, and uh, have a whole session dedicated to it. Well, the uh, official unemployment rate has been over 5% for the last 10 years. Do you support achieving full employment by using public funds to create jobs, caring for people in the environment with pay set at least minimum wage? Um, I, I, I support people being able to live dignified lives. I'm always worried about the... Uh, I'm attracted to the idea of guaranteed work, uh, but I am fearful of the work for the dole. So uh, that's where I, I, because I've not held a portfolio that's required me to become particularly uh, conversant with this, and, and Barbara, I will hand this over to yourself and to, to Rex in a minute because you'll, you'll know more about this, but I'm anxious about something that sounds great but turns into, you know, remember the Green Corps that Tony Abbott was doing and, you know, let's get people out looking after the environment and it just turned into work for the dole and people were having a dreadful time. So I, I'm much more interested in how, for example, Job Seeker, as it's now called, that level really matters. So we, we can't allow a society where people are expected to live below the poverty level because that's what we choose to pay them. But what kind of society sets it there? So, so I'm interested in that and then interested in how people can lead those meaningful lives and be fully engaged. And of course, I'm interested overwhelmingly interested in how education helps this. We have 25% of our kids don't finish school. And that is a lot greater than it was when I was at school when it was under 50%. Uh, so who, who completed school. Now it's got, so it hovers around 73 to 74 to 75% that finish school with, it, with their SACE. But that's not a successful future because you cannot leave 25% of the population behind. So I guess I'm more interested in that than constructing a, is it a guaranteed job? Is it work for the dole? Is it decent universal beneficial, uh, universal income? I love those debates, but I haven't settled my mind on them. I certainly haven't settled my party on them. I'll just get you to pass to Barbara, please, to respond. Yeah, um, it's such an important question, isn't it? Um, 
I, I feel like in an environment we are now with over 7 per cent official unemployment and probably closer to 15, 16 per cent unemployment, an enormous amount of people out of, uh, have given up on looking. And when we're spent, I mean, the title of this event is Clean Recovery. We're spending an enormous amount of money uh, at the federal level without paying attention to the job richness of our spend. Um, in the 80s recession, I was working in the Newcastle area uh, on job creation in the Hunter Valley. And we made uh, the government, New South Wales and the federal government, it was under Hawke Keating, um, made very specific targeted uh, expenditures across Australia, focusing the money where the unemployed were, looking at what the profile of unemployed people in the Hunter Valley were, or in Western Adelaide or Eastern Northern Adelaide, and working out, okay, they're young people, there's a lot of recent arrivals or whatever the profile was, and then talking to the community about what's needed. What was needed? Well, we needed to repair uh, the surf life-saving clubs that we built in the 1930s in the previous period of long-term unemployment. The community got to decide a whole lot of things that it needed, and people got jobs where they wanted it. Now we're seeing spends which are not targeted at um, uh, people who, who need it. The people who have lost their jobs in this recession, unlike the 90s and the 80s, are young people way disproportionately, and women. And what we're seeing is a lot of um, fluoro vest uh, investment. It's really a long a set up periods. It doesn't offer employment to those who need it right now. And it's not asking our local communities what we want. So I think there's an enormous amount we can do, and I haven't even started on our care economy, aged care and childcare, obvious places to, to be investing to create jobs and do good things that our community values. Rex, I'm going to ask, since you've alluded to it already, uh, what role do you see for advanced manufacturing in addressing these key issues of climate, unemployment and inequality? Well, I think it's really in, important. It has a, uh, we've seen um, uh, manufacturing in this country uh, decline uh, over a number of years. I think we're sitting just below, sorry, just above box one at the moment in terms of um, you know, our manufacturing as a, as a percentage of GDP. Um, one of the big problems that I face in Canberra all the time, uh, and I know the, the three parties are aligned on this, is is uh, there's often a um, there's there's often a uh, a push for free trade, and often that comes at the expense of uh, uh, doing things here because of something called competitive advantage, some theory that uh, economists put forward about competitive advantage, saying, saying that uh, you know, if, it's, if it's cheaper to do it in another place, if they're more efficient. We see the government impose, correctly in my view, things like um, minimum wages, uh, um, uh, superannuation uh, guarantees, uh, holiday loadings, uh, environmental standards, uh, uh, occupation health and safety standards, we impose those upon Australian businesses and that costs money and then we go, boy, those people from Vietnam or from China or from Indonesia are offering a much cheaper product, not recognising the difference between price and, and value and not comparing things on a level playing field. And we need, to, we need to do that. And if we did that, we would find that the Australians are, are uh, extremely competitive. We also need to, to think about uh, value-add when we're thinking about, uh, again, the free market. I would much rather see us uh, taking iron ore and, uh, and rather than just exporting the rocks, okay, taking iron ore and turning it into green steel, taking uh, the lithium that we export out of the Pilbara uh, right now, uh, and instead of exporting it, uh, turn it into lithium-ion batteries that can contribute to uh, some of our solutions uh, in terms of uh, climate change. So we, we need to rethink the way we do things. It, and and it, doesn't it doesn't necessarily change uh, how much we might spend. It's an attitude thing that would yield fantastic results in in terms of employment and, and generating intellectual property along the way, generating that, uh, you know, that, that some of that intangible value as well. So uh, I think it's got a, a key part to play and it's not hard if you can get past the free trade extremists that currently uh, reside inside the government.
all of those things require significant spending and investment. <laughs> it's it's still a, a, an economical question, not not so much about values, about whether we find things from Australia. I I, I think uh, I will give an opportunity uh, actually to Barbara just to talk about uh, what role we might see for uh, green hydrogen as as an as an alternative, uh, something we can invest in. I don't know whether anyone's listened to Twiggy Forrest's um, uh, lecture. What are the, what's the lecture series called? Boy, the Boy Lecture. Yeah, go and have a listen. It's really fascinating um, because, uh, in a way, it doesn't matter what I think about green hydrogen and it doesn't matter what um, the Greens think about green. It doesn't matter, really, because capitalism is just riding straight in there and uh, saddling up for the rapid conversion. Um, he's thinking that he's... Uh, the trucks in his iron ore mine will be uh, run on green hydrogen within 10 years. Uh, he expects his entire operation to be extremely profitable, entirely run on green hydrogen. And he says, um, and he's just done that amazing uh, trip, or I don't usually sing Twiggy Forrest's uh, uh, praises quite so energetically, but you know, he's saying this is going to happen really fast. This is going to happen quickly. China. Uh, Japan, South Korea, many countries, and our own states are now stepping into a competition with each other to see who can most make the fastest shift. Um, and before long, we will have electric cars which will go leap over the models that we have now, he's arguing, uh, and so are many other people. So I think green hydrogen is a really exciting thing. Uh, it's an example of a technology that will come into its own really fast. Um, and I think, you know, I, I'm, I think we need to do many things. But the, the notion of getting very quickly to 100% renewables is a really important part of our response to the existential crisis that we face. Sorry, we'd just like to jump in with the, the clean hydrogen thing. I don't think most people in the room probably realise but most of the initial planning on how to build a green hydrogen economy was done here in Adelaide 12 years ago and was totally and utterly ignored. One of the best professors from this university wrote a paper on it, was invited to present it in most of the rest of the world, and that's why nearly every other country is ready to go. So my question to the three of you panellists is, you're all used to dealing with this, that we're a really clever country that are really slow. <laughs> we're really slow. Yeah, as a country. Like, tons of clever people, but on implementation yeah. of cleverness. And this is for any of the three of you, or all three of you. How do we go from clever to rubber on the road moving. Because the moment we have clever, and the tyre's over there somewhere. I, th I think it always comes back to uh, leadership uh, as, as, as the answer. And uh, right now, uh, at the federal level, we have a government that simply uh, isn't, isn't prepared to back that. And that makes all of the difference. And that leaves uh, people like Barbara, Susan, myself uh, in Canberra um, uh, trying to use, uh, you know, trying to pressure, trying to get change using the media, using a whole range of different techniques. But ultimately, it comes down to a lack of leadership. Now, it, I will stand up for some of my coalition colleagues in the Senate because they're not, you know, some of them are quite okay with the idea of climate change. If I look at what happened in the energy sector where we went from uh, an EIS to a CET to an NEG to the NEG, um, uh, there, was a, you know, there was a lot of agreement right across the parliament in relation to uh, those propositions. Um, what undid Ma Malcolm Turnbull, uh, he stood up and said, I'm trying to find a solution uh, that is clean, that's reliable, that's affordable. Uh, he, he came up with a, a reasonable mix, might not have been perfect, but certainly better than, than, than where we were, uh, where we are now. And uh, he got it through his party room, but eventually just a few people inside the coalition objected, were in a position to threaten his leadership, and uh, that caused the abandoning of that particular program uh, about a week later Malcolm Turnbull was gone. And I see it now in the Senate when some of these propositions are put up, there, there are a few people in the, inside the coalition that uh, are causing uh, the, the, the 
the stalling of programs that are absolutely necessary, uh, the, the sorts of things you're talking about. And uh, uh, that's because the people in Canberra often focus on staying in Canberra, being in power, and that's, they seem to put that ahead of uh, uh, all of the rest of us. Uh, so as I stand up for my coalition uh, colleagues, I'm also highly critical of the way that that system works. Susan, at a state Indeed. level. Indeed. And uh, they installed the coal fondler, didn't they? Yeah. God. Um, uh, so state level, just two things about the green hydrogen. I think uh, one of the very exciting things for South Australia is that uh, because we have such a high proportion of renewable energy and it has, uh, I believe it's called spillover, the excess energy that's available uh, that uh, more than is needed at a given moment because it might be very windy, it might be very sunny. Uh, if we can put that into hydrogen, uh, then that is the, the, the virtue uh, that we're mopping up excess energy and we're turning it into effectively a mechanism for storing energy. So uh, I think that's tremendously exciting. Uh, I know that Jay Weatherall, when he was Premier, uh, really pushed a hydrogen strategy and I um, am pleased that this uh, Liberal government is continuing to pursue that. So, so that's excellent. Your, your bigger question, your heavier question, was why do we um, mess up so often in Australia? Why do we have some very intelligent person or a great team of people and then uh, the idea come, flowers in a university and then uh, it, it goes elsewhere because no one uh, here is interested. And, and my answer is twofold really. One is I think that we have um, uh, for successive years and therefore both sides of parliament uh, have not supported the university sector to be what it could be and is in many other nations. So um, what we're having at the moment is completely heartbreaking, but it's not brand new, uh, that we require universities to uh, rely on international students to prop up research is just uh, a, a not the behaviour of a nation that wants to be a, a very advanced economy in a low carbon future. So um, I think we need to rethink the role of universities in our economy. And therefore, to give more priority and more space and more f uh, flexibility to these wonderful academics who come up with great ideas. I also think there's a cultural problem. That's the, that's the harder one to really uh, put your finger on. When I was briefly uh, manufacturing minister in 2014, I came across many businesses that had come up with brand new intellectual property that were able to make uh, extraordinary a product, uh, often in the medical sphere, and yet could not get uh, into SA Health. So they'd be able to sell it in other states, they'd be able to sell it overseas, but they couldn't quite manage it here. And I've, I've never really satisfied myself why that is, but it is infuriating uh, that we don't recognise what we do as being good enough somehow. And I don't know if it's a cringe, I don't know if it's... I don't know, and you know, you'll have your own theories, but I think we need to tackle the cultural thing, but if we gave the universities greater priority, greater flexibility, greater space just to be smart, then we would have a greater chance as a country. It's hot. I totally agree with everything you've just said, Susan, and I really feel for the academic that you refer to, yeah. the team, because I can only imagine <coughs> how heartbreaking that must be. Um, and I, I think we're not only have we not funded our unis in the way we should have in the last 20 years, we've actually given them over to casual employment in our teaching force. We've taken a billion dollars out of our university research in the last year and a bit. Uh, we're actually going backwards really seriously and I feel really strongly about it because I think it's a very political act that we're witnessing on our universities. It's a bit like the attack on the ABC. It's a cultural attack and it has a really big impact on our future and certainly our children's future. And the other thing I think that's really important in terms of transmit tr transmitting our terrific research findings into real effect is the investment climate to assist people to make the most of what we have has been all wrong for at least 10 years and probably longer in the, in the climate wars we've witnessed. Just take the existence of the um, Australian Renewable Energy Agency, ARENA, okay? 
it has spent $20 billion on 600 projects, and it was set up a tiny little project, really, uh, that grew out of the, mo the moment, if I may mention, when the Greens held balance of power in, in the Gillard government, and it was something we argued for very strongly, and the, uh, uh, an assertive Labor Party joined and thought that was a great idea. Now, that has made a huge difference. What we see right now in our parliament, however, is a proposal uh, from the Morrison government that that agency should be redirected to fund gas and coal. And Rex will be voting on that legislation, and so will uh, Senator, um, so will Re Rebecca Sharkey. This is really important. You know, South Australia matters to the, uh, our senators and our members really make a difference in our federal parliament to the climate that's created for how we make the most of our manufacturing and, and other um, innovations. At any point, I would imagine that the audience may, we have a question already. <laughs> I will actually just mention that some of our questions that I've been asking tonight have been from our audience. They have pre-submitted them. So thank you to Stuart Sweeney, uh, Andrew Borman, and Margaret Dingle, who is from SA Renewable Energy Policy Group. So thank you for submitting questions early. No. Uh, and I thought I'm the only one that has a terrible time with mics. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I acknowledge the Ghana people as the true owners of this land and hope for their betterment. Um, I think that we are really skirting around a very radical question. Uh, the movie we saw um, really presupposed a very serious modification of capitalism. Uh, since the Buchananites got going in the 1950s, uh, see the Democracy in Chains book, um, uh, there's been a gradual privatization and it's still going on here and now. We've just done the last little thing about the trains, they're being privatised, and the whole point is that capitalism uh, depends on this high unemployment. To call 5% uh, uh, full employment is just ridiculous. And my question is, how can we uh, sit here and talk about lovely projects like the forest uh, mine working at greater and greater profit, uh, is that going to actually decrease the income gap, the inequality, the privatisation of schools and so on? Uh, is that going to happen? Uh, who would you like to direct the question to? Anyone who would like to answer or someone specifically? Um, I, I wasn't singing Twiggy Frost praises for his uh, philanthropy. Um, he is one of the great uh, beneficiaries of the pandemic, uh, along with Gina Reinhart. $85 billion has gone to 43 millionaire, millionaire, billionaires actually, sorry, in Australia in, in the last year. So that has really pulled out inequality. We've got money going really in a concentrated way to the top end of our income scale. Uh, and I was answering the question in relation to Twiggy uh, about green hydrogen. And, uh, and I, I, I do admire what he's doing. I'm very interested in what he does. But it's not just Twiggy doing it, of course. He's looking at making a buck out of it, and like many other places. But it's the investment climate that's created. And I do think capitalism is showing itself as a pretty interesting beast at the moment. I think we've got... Uh, people in the private sector um, who are ahead, way ahead of our government in many ways. And I think that's you know, interesting to watch. How does a government uh, keep defending coal and gas in the way it is and a whole bunch of other sectors are disadvantaged by their strategy? And I think we should be talking more about um, uh, captive governments and about uh, integrity in government. I haven't dealt with privatisation. I don't know whether others want to. 
Yeah, I'll take on uh, privatisation. Um, <laughs> yeah, but one of the reasons that governments privatise uh, uh, utilities is because they're running short of cash. Uh, it's the reason, you know, if you try and find, find the policy reason for um, uh, seeking to impose a, an electric vehicle um, road user uh, charge at this point in time, it's simply because we've gone through COVID. Uh, the uh, treasury chest is, is bare and... They think it's bare. Yeah, yeah. They, they're, they're, they're looking for uh, ways to you know, balance their budget. Um, so, so governments do this be, uh, you know, seeking ways in which to generate money so they can go and spend money on other things. I think we could, um, uh, I, I think the proper solution to this, so I don't think we should be privatising utilities, I, I don't believe that's a, a sensible thing to do. If we want to get money into the, into the um, uh, uh, Treasury uh, chest is start looking at things like tax reform. There are something like 250 companies that over the last five years of ta tax transparency data uh, that is now published fed federally have have had a combined revenue of eight hundred billion dollars and not paid a cent in tax. Uh, those companies operate in Australia enjoying our education system, enjoying the medical um, health care uh, medical and health care um, uh, that our a system provides them, they enjoy the roads that lead to their factories, they enjoy the, uh, the, the security of the police, they enjoy the, 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 the uh, justice system that we provide, they enjoy the defence forces that uh, protect their assets and they don't contribute a brass razoo in terms of tax. Um, right now there's a debate going on about, uh, about uh, media. Uh, two of the players involve Google and Facebook you know, if you ever if you boost a Facebook post, uh, if you try and do that, uh, you'll see a, a credit card transaction uh, when you, once you've done that, and then you'll see another little transaction saying international transaction fee to Ireland. Every single dollar of Facebook boosted money uh, here in Australia, even though you might be you you might be an Australian business targeting a an Australian company. Oh, sorry, sorry, an Australian. Uh, uh, audience, Australian customers, uh, the money goes to Ireland. Uh, the uh, you know, Google, their, their revenue goes to Singapore and then moves on to Bermuda. So even Singapore doesn't <laughs> win uh, as a tax haven. So w if we could address some of this, this, uh, this greed, and I've, I've done a series of speeches in the, in the Senate and I can't repeat them here because I, I have to rely on privilege, but I've named, and, you know, I, I don't name companies anymore. I actually name the directors of these companies because it isn't the companies that, that are avoiding tax. It is the corporate executives who, who are actually paid to minimise tax. And uh, you'll see words like scumbag and, and other sorts of things that I've used under privilege. Uh, and and uh, and I've uh, you know, uh, every Tuesday night in the in the in the Senate when the Senate's sitting, there's a good chance that I'll that I'll call be calling one of these exec executives out. We have to change the system. We have to restore a social license uh, uh, arrangement with these companies to make sure they contribute. That's fair. I'm I'm going to look up this transcripts now. Fantastic. And your your question is so interesting about the nature of capitalism though and whether it's fit for purpose, whether it ever was but particularly whether it is in the climate crisis and, and what we're facing uh, and I don't think that we're tonight going to be able to determine an, an entirely alternative economic system but I do think that we've seen tremendous pressure placed on the uh, cap version of capitalism that writes government out of the picture and we've had the brief flash of first the GFC and then uh, COVID um, earlier the original New Deal and now of course the proposition of the Green New Deal uh, that puts government back into the picture and um, being equipped with modern monetary theory uh, to pay for things. Um, I, I have some hope that the, the debate is moving in, in a place that, that reinstalls government. Uh, at the centre because um, although the privatisation of individual assets is problematic, what is really problematic is the hollowing out of our social democratic project in Australia, that uh, public schools are now just a thin veneer holding together but are you know, paper thin 
uh, that, that uh, our school system has become a, a vehicle for intergenerational privilege being transmitted. Um, and that's because we have let go of the idea of everyone going to school together. Uh, the same is true of, of uh, public housing, that it's become um, so residualised that it is, you know, the, the number of people I have crying in my office every single week because they are desperate to just live somewhere safe. Uh, the, 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 there were similar challenges in health, although there are also great differences. Uh, but, but so we've got a real challenge about what is public and public means shared. Um, I, I worry that something like COVID brings us together, as was, was pointed out at the beginning, and then the minute that it seems to abate, uh, we, we retreat. Uh, how we make collectively the, the conversation not allow politicians to do that is, is the real challenge, isn't it? Um, politicians must lead, but the people must also hold them to be where they need to be. Uh, so that's why I love coming to things like this, because it encourages and emboldens uh, all of us, I think, to know that there are people who understand the issues and care about them and are prepared to talk to their friends and neighbours and grandparents and, you know, spread the word. Uh, so I don't, I'm not entirely miserable about it, but if we don't have those conversations, then I don't see really how we make it through. Thank you very much. Um, could we take I'll turns, just, please? We'll just yes. take turns front to back. Though. Can I ask that you direct a question to one of our panel members and that we try and keep some of the answers a little bit shorter? Yes, thank you. Yes, hi. Um, my question is for any of the panel members who'd like to pick it up, but it is, what can we do right now? So what one or two policy levers would you flip immediately? Uh, we know that the recovery effort is uneven. Barbara's correctly identified that it's young people and women who've lost their work. What one or two policy levers would you flip right now to assist those people? I might put this toward Rex, yes, thank you. Okay, so one of them I mentioned in my opening, and that is uh, in relation to, to climate change, we could, uh, w w uh, we could just incentivise electric vehicles. Uh, that's a relatively simple thing to do. It doesn't involve a lot of money and uh, uh, could create jobs uh, and uh, the, the other benefits that I talked about in my opening speech. That's something really simple. Other, other things that are uh, very simple uh, that, that we could do, actually perhaps they're not simple but would have huge effect, things like tax reform. Um, I, I sat in the Senate uh, for almost uh, uh, three days debating the changes to education reform um, I, I, uh, and of course our hours were extended uh, so that we could do that uh, and everyone was you know, had a passionate position to put uh, I, I contrast that, that with um, uh, with a statement made by a defense official in Senate estimates where a submarine project goes from 50 billion dollars to 89 billion dollars and no one cares we debate a billion dollars uh, on, on education for three, for three days and someone just says, oh, well, we've just got a blowout of, of, of $39,000 million. Uh, to put that into proper perspective, that's $2.8 million per day for the next 38 years in blowout cost. And no one cares. No one, no one, no, no one even debates that. So there are lots of things we, we could do um, to... Uh, where we can get the, the money to solve a whole range of different problems, uh, again, it comes down to leadership. So, so can I follow that up? I, I, I know that the audience has a question. The more pointed question, I might put it toward Barbara. So how do we get the people into power that will make the right decisions? We have the solutions. We, we know what we need to do. <laughs> I wanted my two things, though. <laughs> yeah, come on. Everyone have their two things the, in there. Two things. Well, if I can't price carbon tomorrow, which would be my number one, and I know it's a bit long term and we're a bit too. Um, yeah, but we had a plan in the box. We could pull it out, dust it off, fix yeah, it. Yeah, we've got one. Yeah, we yeah. knew it worked. It's the only time our carbon emissions ever fell. But I would go for two things immediately. One is free childcare. We can afford it, it'll create a lot of jobs. Um, they're low carbon jobs, as AOC said. Um, it's incredibly important for three- and four-year-olds to get quality early education, especially in poor households. I know there are people in this audience who know this much better than me, who work with kids and know that there's so much research on it. So free childcare, it's five billion. It's a shocking thing that we came through the last 30 years with millions of women. 
entering our labour market and we have put the cost on their families and we have put them in the hands, in some states in particular, in private. Anyone? Sorry, I'm on my soapbox. Second thing. Um, the second thing, the second thing. Oh, I know what I'd do. I would uh, immediately increase um, uh, Job Seeker. Um, it's a boon for the economy instantly. Every dollar of it gets spent. And when we introduced, uh, when the federal government introduced uh, the Job Seeker bonus, extra payment, we took uh, millions of Australians out of poverty with a stroke of a pen. We know we can do that and we should be investing our money right there because it changes people's lives, it puts food in fridges and it really uh, uh, accelerates the economy. Thank you. We have another question? No, Susan. Uh, you haven't had your chance, Susan. Oh, no, no. Uh, well, it, sorry, we've got to move on, David. We have another question. Yeah, I wanted to do that one. <laughs> That's OK. Um, yes, a Andrew Zona, thank you, panel for a very interesting, interesting discussion. Twelve months ago I learned about modern monetary theory and in this very venue. Um, and now, I've, after a lot of study, I, it just drives me nuts when I hear about taxpayer funds, debt, deficit, the reliance on federal government for revenue. Uh, sorry, sorry, Senator Patrick, I don't want to single you out, but you're, you're certainly not alone in the fe federal sphere uh, believing um, that f the federal government uh, needs revenue for, for payment. So, I've got a general question and a, and a specific question. The general one is how do we change that narrative? How do we put these stupid terms to the dustbin of politics? A specific question that relates to the seat of New England, Joel Fitzgibbon's seat, because it's going to be a big thing for the transition and it's all about jobs. Um, and not all of those, first of all, there aren't that many jobs really in the scheme of things, uh, but in the, there are also some very high uh, highly paid jobs such as mining engineers. Just imagine a scenario where modern monetary theory is, is, accept, accept, is accepted and all those crappy terms are put to bed. We have a job guarantee, so there's a firm um, pathway for transitioning jobs, but there's a very specific issue of highly paid executives and engineers uh, having the choice of going to a minimal wage of um, whatever society de government depends, uh, determines that's going to be, how do we get around an issue like that? I'm trying to get beyond the specifics that don't get anywhere to a, a real tangible potential issue that there might be in the future. So I will reconstitute that and I appreciate your question as I think something I brought up before which is that we have solutions for things like a just transition or a job guarantee. Uh, how do we get the people in, in, in power either to know about that or the people that already know into power? Because either works and neither are currently working. <laughs> yeah, just briefly. So, so one of the um, real challenges is that that's exactly what Labor took to the last federal election. Uh, a, a just transition and we lost. So uh, it isn't a simple matter of convincing one side of politics or two sides of politics. It is uh, a matter of building a case that is convincing for the Australian people uh, because that loss is going to reverberate for a long time. Uh, that was a painful uh, wound inflicted on a party that had an ambitious and very public focused and climate focused policy. Uh, so how do we get good people in? You have to convince us that it's worth it, <laughs> that, uh, you know, that um, you can get into politics and actually make a difference. Uh, and we need to have people vote for the best option of, in front of them. And uh, I don't believe that happened at the last election, obviously, because I'm partisan, so I, obviously I, th I thought that Labor should win. Not to be rude, um, but the narrative was yeah. slightly different to our questioner's narrative. So it's not as if the, the campaign was exactly what what was based on like the question's content. Uh, oh, well, I apologise. <laughs> well, I didn't mean to shut you up. Uh, question from the back now. Um, you had your hand up first. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my question is about um, your, opi your opinion on the role of community um, in pushing for a climate-focused economic recovery. 
Um, and I'm happy for any of you to pick it up, potentially those who have had a little bit more um, time serving as elective representatives. Um, there's people been marching, rallying, doing all sorts of things for a very long time to try and convince uh, leaders to make these sorts of decisions. It's, in some cases there's been some effect for a very long time. We haven't seen the effects that we'd like to see. Um, you know, it's got to the point now that we not only need rapid climate mitigation, we also need adaptation, which has become the more politically acceptable terminology to use. Um, so I guess I want to know what, in your opinion, do you think that the community's role is, community members, community organisations, in pushing for this um, clean future that we want to see? What levers exist? What do you need us to do? Um, okay, so I'll have a crack at that. Um, the, the, wh one of the things uh, that has to happen in order to get change at the political level is there has to be uh, education occur. And that doesn't mean necessarily turning up to a rally. I'm not criticising people who do, but it's, it, 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 it's about informing right across the community and up through uh, the, the leadership, up through the public service, uh, to, to get a general uh, change. I look at things like, uh, so, for example, New Start, now Job Seeker, uh, and the way that debate has played out. Uh, what, what has helped uh, get support in, in Canberra for that is the fact that we have uh, um, uh, ACOS and the Business Council of Australia uh, standing up saying this is the right thing to do and uh, businesses. We see it in climate change now where industry is uh, in some sense taking a lead or some industries are taking a lead in terms of climate change uh, and uh, forcing those in power to, to listen. It's about educating and doing it in a way that uh, where, we, where we educate everyone uh, to the point where the, the resistance uh, evaporates. Can I just add, even though I'm not an elected representative, that I think the community is incredibly important and I think our politicians are only going to respond if there is huge community organisations. So young people taking strike action on climate uh, action is really important and I think the many things that are going on in the community matter a great deal. But it's not enough. I think that's what you're implying in your question. I also think we need leaders who tell the truth and this is the great thing that Greta gives us is she asks for a simple thing, truth telling. And it's really important that people know the truth and are not divided and told lies as they were in the last election, which was so disappointing. I also hope the that we don't draw the lesson from that um, time, Susan, where, where nothing with ambition in it comes forward from progressive parties. That would be a terrible lesson to draw. Uh, my name's Andrew Kitto. I'd like to go back to Rex Patrick's comment right at the start of this discussion about the South Australian blackout that happened a few years ago, where I think you came very close to talking about the reasons for it, but you backed away from that. Um, there's been other comments at different times about why aren't we moving faster towards renewable energy, why aren't we moving faster in terms of hydrogen and so on. And I'd like to put to perhaps you, Rex, and also Susan, what do you think of the role of market failure in all these issues? Because I personally think there's a dramatic market failure within the energy industry. So I'd just like perhaps both of you to comment on that, please. Yeah, look, I do uh, think there, there has been market failure, and that market failure is caused uh, in some sense by a lack of uh, a bipartisan approach to the problem. Uh, often investment in energy uh, is, is a long-term uh, prospect and those that want to invest need surety in, in, in understanding the, you know, the, the money they put into uh, a renewable project, whatever the project is, uh, uh, will give a return at some point in time uh, and that requires a consistency of, of, of policy and unfortunately we, we haven't seen that. Look, I wasn't backing away from the, uh, the, the South Australian blackout. I remember, remember the night it happened. I was actually in, in Canberra and, and I have I've been involved in inquiries in relation to that. And I know people um, 
you know, staunchly defend the re renewable uh, sector. I am a big defender of the new renewable sector. I want change. Uh, I'm also an engineer. I looked at uh, uh, what happened that evening. We, we did have one failure in the system. Every part of the system is supposed to be able to, to deal with one failure. It's called N minus one. Uh, we had a, a, a fault in, in a wind farm that, uh, th that uh, wasn't able to, to uh, deal with that failure. Now, of course, that appears to have been a software problem. It didn't, didn't need to be there, but the, the fact of the matter is we had a wind farm that then went out. We now were left with an N-2 situation, two failures, and the rest of the system couldn't cope with that. We had then the interconnector trying to provide power from Victoria to fill the, the void. Uh, that tripped because of overcapacity, and at that point the whole system went down. And we have just recently seen uh, a fine being issued in relation to that wind farm uh, for uh, not meeting that N minus one obligation. Again, that's not, I'm not being critical of, of renewable energy. It's a lesson in saying as we go down this pathway, let's engineer it properly. Rick, you know, sorry to change direction on you. Was that fundamentally a market failure? Well, was that's a technical, technical failure. That, that's a, a technical failure. Yeah, but was the technical failure a consequence of a poorly managed and created market? Um, I actually think it was a function of failure, and I'll direct some of this at Jay Weatherall, uh, a failure to, to properly engineer the market. Uh, the good side of what, he was, what, what his government was doing was trying to get to that renewable uh, energy target as quickly as possible, but, but uh, there were reports that were commissioned that said, when you do that, you need to have things like batteries to firm things up, or uh, technologies like um, pumped hydro, technologies like thermal energy. Uh, so the, the, the project that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Nick Xenophon and I backed uh, to get uh, a solar thermal plant in, in Port Augusta, so that we were using renewables that had a firmness about them, the so ability. So fundamentally the market needed to be better designed to use the technology well, more and, effectively. And so what happens is, one of the things we lost when we lost ETSA was we lost someone who was the, the, the designer of the system yeah. and we went to just little bits, little players weighing in and there was, so there was a failure in terms of the way in which the, the system was architected uh, and uh, it just wasn't a, a properly system engineered. Susan, would you like to add from a state perspective? Uh, oh, yeah, well, I mean, I guess if, if there have been fines issued that implies that the, pr the operators weren't doing something that they were expected to do by the designers of the system, uh, so that's a sort of the, it might, that that implies that the system anticipated this need and the operators weren't meeting it. Um, but I think more significantly, um, the mention of ETSA is at the heart of this. Having um, sold off, given away our uh, capacity to control one of the most essential services we have, um, we've been struggling to to build an energy system that is um, affordable, is uh, low carbon and is reliable without the biggest instrument you can have. And uh, I think that was a terrible, a terrible decision many years ago and we are all continuing to pay the consequences. It goes back to this gentleman's comment about the, the uh, question of public versus private. We've probably got time for maybe two questions. One from the back, one from the front. Fair enough. Okay. Gwydion, you're next. Hi. Um, we heard some uh, discussion from a lot of you um, uh, about things such as uh, the submarines here, about stuff like Twiggy Forest Mine. Um, and I was wondering how, with our um, obsession with job creation, do we make sure that we aren't creating jobs in areas that damage our planet or damage the lives of uh, the workers or our communities in general? Who would you like to direct that to? Um, <sighs> I guess uh, to Susan. Uh, I'm just the one who didn't mention either submarines or Twiggy. But yeah, but, sure. but, but, but um, <laughs> super happy to. You, you, to you were discussing. Um, uh, 
Yeah, look, uh, yeah. Your, question, your question is, is yeah, a job yeah. a job a job or not? And yeah. it's not. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And as we construct this, um, the Green New Deal, as, as AOC calls it, this question of what does the future economy look like? How, where do we put our public, our shared money? Public money isn't government money, it's everybody's money. Uh, how do we put that to drive certain economic outcomes? What are the rules that we set? What's the taxation regime? Which I love that you're talking about that, Rex. It's so important. Every billionaire is a policy failure in my view. Um, but... <laughs> My son wants to turn that into every millionaire, but he's much more hardcore than I am. Um, but but the uh, yeah, how do we? What rules do we put around that? So if we're going to invest in something, if we're going to direct public expenditure, if we're going to uh, have the laws that that generate work in this case, what kind of work? Dignified, well-paid, secure, and low carbon. Uh, and light on the planet, uh, that, that's the utopia, right? That's where we all want to get to and it's a question of designing the system so that, that we get there. And as much as I call it a utopia, if we don't get there, then we're not going to make it. So we've got to. We've got to work out how to do this. Last question. Cool. So my question is to Barbara, but I'm happy to hear answers from the other two as well. How do we retain the progress that we make? because there's been a continuous pattern where we've had free education, free universities, and we've lost it. We've had Commonwealth Employment Scheme until 1998 with full employment, John Howard privatised it. We had a climate tax, the Liberals axed it. How do we make sure that when or if we get a Green New Deal, the governments that come after it don't just axe it and then we're back in this situation again. I think that's such a good question and I don't know the answer but my theory of political change is we need two things to get good stuff happening and to hang on to it and that is a community that insists on certain things. like. Free education is such a no-brainer. We are a very wealthy country. To have imposed the level of debt that we are on young people is a travesty. It is an act of political bastardry and it is a, a, a really shocking thing to do to future generations. Um, and I'm really sorry that Rebecca's not here tonight to, to talk about why she voted for doubling fees for humanities students because these are the subjects where people remember our history. They learn philosophy and ethics. They learn economics. These are, these are so essential to us. So I think our education system is not irrelevant to the question you're raising. So we need people who really value what we get. We need truth-telling in our politics. And I agree with Rex, and Susan made the same point, I think. We need really good leaders. And that goes to our democracy. We need confidence in our democracy. And I think what we see at the moment, even in Australia, and certainly what we've witnessed, in the US is a loss of confidence in our parliament and in our democracy. And I think while that's unfolding and fraying, then we are more at risk of the kind of rising inequality that we're witnessing, the kind of hard-nosed refusal to put enough food in the fridge of someone who's living on job seeker. So yeah, it's complex. We need people on the ground and we need great leaders and good politicians and we need to tell the truth to each other. It's at this point that I would like to get everyone to give us a three-minute final statement. Uh, and we'll start with Barbara. Might as well go in reverse order. Thank you. Um, well, I feel like the question in the room really is, is how do we make change? We, we know, many of us, what we need. How do we make change? And for myself, I didn't expect to be sitting here in 2021 with my hand up to run for the Senate. I haven't had a lifelong longing to put my bottom on the red leather, I can tell you. Um, uh, but I'm doing it because I feel I have been the beneficiary of those 30 years that I mentioned. I feel that I've had those, that education. I had um, the prospect of, of affordable housing. Not everyone in my generation had those things. But I did, and, and I feel great sorrow that future generations feel uh, deep insecurity. Uh, Tim Flannery asks young people to leave the room when he talks about what the facts are on our economy and the 12-year 
uh, opportunity that the IPCC scientists told us we had in 2018. Um, so I feel an obligation and my hand is up for this role um, because I think when I look at the, the, our politics and our, po our parliament, what we do in the next federal election really matters. I'm a community activist, a feminist, a person who's used research to try and influence public debate. This is a different road for me because I think we need two things. We need great research. We need great uh, activism in our community, but we also need leaders who will be independent and work from the science. And I want to say to every South Australian in this room, what you do in the next election really matters. We could have an additional second Green Senator and possible, once again, uh, balance of power in the Federal Senate. And that matters. If I had been in the Senate three months ago, 1.6 million Australians would have an extra $100 in their pocket every fortnight if they're living on JobSeeker. That matters. If I'd been in the parliament three months ago, we wouldn't be imposing the doubling of humanities uh, fees and, and slugging uh, jobs out of our university sector and taking a billion dollars in research funds out. It matters what we do and so I want to encourage every one of you to go home to your community, to your kids, to your family and have a conversation about what we need to do because we can make a difference and we have to make a difference because the time is short. Thank you. Rex, thank you. Yeah, look, uh, a range of different in inter interesting topics uh, tonight. Well, I, d I will answer your question about how do we uh, how do we stop this happening again, and, and the answer to that is find a really good dictator, um, <laughs> but but be very very careful in how you do that. <laughs> okay, so the. Um, uh, it does come to the way our system works. It's not, it isn't a perfect system. I, I can't remember who said it. There was one of them, Winston Churchill, that said that uh, you know democracy is uh, not not a great system, but it's the best of all that we have. Uh, and look, I, I get frustrated. Uh, I'm I'm an accidental senator in that uh, I've, I've had I've done engineering all my life. How the how the hell does a, an engineer end up in in parliament? We're not. Uh, people who can speak and, and go out socially and, and do those sorts of things. We normally get put in a box to build something and told to come out three years after, uh, after you were you're put in there. But the, the system in Canberra, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, it, it's not as was written in the Constitution. We, we, we have a, a government that's in place and uh, they basically control uh, the lower house, so that's just a tick a place where, where governments uh, tick off their legislation goes across to the Senate. Thankfully, there are cross benches in the Senate. Uh, there's not a, a, a majority. That's one thing you definitely have to avoid at the next le election is having a majority uh, in the Senate that, that matches what happens in the in the, in the house. Uh, because politics plays its way all, all, all the way through things. You know, when I'm trying to get access to a document um, in, in the Senate, uh, a document that opens up you know, how sports rorts happened or why, we're doing, why, why the NCCC is going down a path of a, you know, a gas-led recovery, unfortunately, I'll try and use coercive powers of the Senate and I get blocked sometimes by Labor, who are just a bit fearful that... Uh, that uh, using the Senate's power to force a document to be tabled might just happen to them when they get into government. Uh, these are all sorts of problems that we have to deal with. Uh, uh, people need to pay a lot more attention to what happens in the Parliament. Unfortunately, uh, we're in a situation where very few people do. You are clearly interested in this topic. I stand at polling booths and hand out how to vote cards and most people that turn up have no idea uh, who, who they're voting for, what it stands for, uh, and uh, you know, it's hugely, hugely problematic. And if we accept the idea that leaders count in this, uh, you know, we have to address some of those problems. Uh, I'll just finally mention political donations as well is another huge, huge area of problems. Uh, almost impossible to get reform on polit political donations because every time uh, a bill comes up in relation to political donations, the Liberal Party and the Labor Party go into conference and they come out and present the answer to, to, uh, to Australia. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just leave that, uh, I'll just leave at that point. But we do need to, to try and fix our system. There are elements that are broken uh, about it and very broken.
Thank you, Rex. Thank you. Um, uh, I think what's it happened to me tonight and is the message I'd like to leave with you is the recognition of in the interconnectedness of these issues. Um, that we started talking about climate change and the recovery and we end talking about uh, democracy and public funding uh, and education and the nature of uh, employment conditions. And that's because they are all relevant. Uh, I particularly liked Barbara talking about truth uh, because if we lose hold of that being at the centre of our political discourse, we are finished. And that is up to every politician, of course, but every citizen as well. Uh, and I think if we can hold on to a concept of truth that is, uh, d that is debatable and contestable and is based on evidence, and if we can understand that our, democratic, uh, our democracy rests on certain institutions that are public institutions, like public education, like uh, the uh, honest um, uh, treatment of, of donations to political parties, uh, transparency, uh, that, that we have an opportunity to reshape Australia in the way that we all would like to see it. And uh, what it all comes down to for me is the interconnectedness of all of humans, that we have to accept that no one can do well until we all do well. well thank you all for joining us. It, uh, it takes some bravery, I think, to stand up in front of a grassroots <laughs> uh, forum like this and and speak your truth so we we truly appreciate it and i think that um we should all give a round of applause for all three of our panelists and as we're talking about truth and and being informed of course there are a lot of resources that you can find within the kind of sustainable prosperity action group world where you can become probably a little bit more informed and make the right decisions at the polling booth. So um, uh, thank you to SPAG for putting this on as well and having us. He politely declined <laughs> our invitation and then we um, invited uh, Senator Simon Birmingham but he was unable to make it as well. So in the interest of balance we wanted to secure representation from all parties. Now finally um, there are a couple of things you can do if, if you're motivated to want to do a bit more. There's a petition uh, um, calling on the federal government to support a clean recovery. There are many copies of it on the desk at the front so you're more than welcome to sign it on the way out. We've been holding a few summer schools um, entitled Rethinking Capitalism and they're really exploring the three issues that have been at the centre of our discussion tonight around climate change, growing inequality and full employment. We have another, we've had one, we've got another one next weekend but it's fully subscribed and we're now planning a third one that's the weekend after Easter on the 9th and 10th of April I think. Um, finally, we are entirely volunteer run and volunteer funded, um, so if you can find your way to uh, donate a few small shekels um, to support the, um, you know, putting on these kind of events, we'd be most appreciated. And we've got one of those, one of those little white electronic things, we've joined the modern age so you can tap your card on it. And finally, I guess the question for...